Hey everybody, this is kind of a multi-purpose video or a multi-audience video, you might say. So for my my blog readers, this is to uh, to make up a little bit for the lack of um, replayable annotated games that I've had for a while. And for my regular chess videos crowd, uh, this is to make up for those of you who are just sick to death of um, Rui Lopez videos. So everybody gets something a little bit different. By the way, for those of you who aren't familiar with my blog, it's thechessmind.net. So if you punch that in, or of course just look up my name, you'll find it right away. So the chess mind, got to have the in there. So the chess mind dot net. All right. So this is from the um, recently completed Russian championship, which finished in a six-way tie. And then Dmitry Andreykin, who uh, very young player, very strong guy, obviously. Uh, they're all strong, very strong guys. But uh, Andreykin won the World Junior Championship just two years ago, and is um, a very very strong blitz player. I think his um, his ICC handle is D squared, so you can look him up there. I think I managed to beat him once. Um, uh, of course, you know, there's no question which of the two of us is the stronger blitz player, but at least I, I think I did get him one time. I'll have to, to check that. I know I scored against him. I think it was a win. Anyway, uh, great player, so it's something I can, uh, I can um, kind of brag about a little bit if he ever becomes a world championship contender, which, you know, he's got good chances to him. He's, like I said, he's a pretty young guy, so who knows. Anyway, his opponent in this game is uh, Sanan Sugarov, very strong player uh, and a young guy. I mean, I think he's still maybe 17 years old, something like that, from Kalmykia. So uh, this was played in round six. Oh, so yeah, I said six players tied for first. Andreykin won the playoff, uh, which was a rapid playoff. It was game 15, and uh, he won pretty comfortably at that. All right, so this is from round six of the main event. Sugarov was, uh, unfortunately for him, kind of the punching bag in this event. So he was dead last. Uh, the other nine players were, were within a point of each other. So you had six tie for first with um, plus one scores. Uh, Grishik was half a point behind, and then two guys had another half point back. And then Sugarov really was the uh, the rabbit of the event. So he lost four games and didn't win any. So uh, let's have a look at this one. Andreykin had white, and it was classical Carol Kim. By the way, I'll just mention some of you might wonder why knight to d2. I mean, this looks kind of ugly. Um, you know, why they are rather than knight to c3? The answer is that uh, it's thought, at least by by many, that if black is to play, if black decides to play g6, which is the only real alternative here to d takes e4, then it's uh, it's better to have the knight on d2, so you can play c3 if you if you so desire. So that's the point of that little finesse. All right, let me see, by the way, what's which is more common. I'm just going to take a quick check. Yeah, it looks like knight c3 is more common, but knight to d2 has a better better percent score. Um, all right, so there you go. Knight d2 takes, takes. And now, of course, the most popular line is bishop to f5, which is very, very heavily theoretical. Um, I think I did a video on this for you guys um, not too long ago of the kamsky Sirwan game from the U.S. Championship. So there, uh, Kamsky won a very nice game with some impressive preparation. Basically, the whole game was preparation. Sierra Wan just fell into a very nice combination where he essentially just got mated. But uh, as I pointed out there, and you know, as you can easily confirm for yourself running an engine, uh, Black at least probably was okay. I think it was Rook to D8 at some point instead of whatever he did just before the sacrifices started. So something like, maybe his bishop takes c5 was the blender there. Anyway, bishop f5 has tons and tons of theory, um, and you can get a little bit of it from that video. In our game, Sugarov played knight to d7, which is another main move. And uh, here white has a bunch of options. You can play the old-fashioned knight f3, which is not terrible. You can play knight to g5, which isn't a bad move. There's also bishop to d3, which is fairly closely related to knight to g5. And then there's the um, slightly, well, old-fashioned is, isn't correct. I mean, it's old-fashioned relative to maybe knight to g5, but um, it's certainly a more recent idea than knight to f3. Anyway, it's still an important move. Uh, black plays knight g to f6, and now knight g5 with an obvious threat, e6. Queen e2, again with an obvious threat. Don't play something like h6 or bishop to d6 here because knight f7 check will, will kill you. Uh, knight f7, not check, knight f7, king f7, queen e6, king d3, uh, g6, 
and then bishop to d3 is um, mating very quickly. King h5, queen h3 mate, for instance. So knight b6 is forced, and now, well, okay, maybe black can play queen e7, but that's a, a terrible move. But, all right, knight b6 is the, the only sensible move here, and now white chooses between bishop to b3 and bishop to d3, and the moves are about equally popular. All right, um, sometimes black plays c5 now, and it's certainly something that he wants to play, but it may be better to first kick the knight back with h6, which is what happened in the game. So after c5, takes, takes, knight 1 to f3. Here, if, if um, h6, trying to transpose, or rather to get a favorable version because the, the wrong, the other knights are already occupying f3, well, knight to e4 is in fact convenient for white, and he stands slightly better. It may just be better for black to, to castle here, straight away. Maybe he's got chances for equality still. But it's probably simpler just to play h6 now, Although, as we'll see, this does have a potential drawback. So knight, F, uh, knight 5 to c3, c5. All right, the main move and the move in the game was d takes c5. But bishop to e3 has had some high-level outings as well. And although it's a lot less common than the text, um, white seems to be doing okay. It's causing some problems for black. Uh, black generally chooses between two moves here. Uh, I don't think either is the most common in the database, but they both seem to be better. Maybe maybe a6 is the most common. Anyway, a6 takes away any bishop to b5 ideas, especially in conjunction with knight to e5. And um, the other move is queen to c7 with the idea of c4. All right, so d takes c5. And now an interesting move, not the most common um, choice, but, but a reasonably common one, is knight b back to d7. And um, here are the most successful reply among White's non-trivial options. I mean, there are some some variations that have been, or some moves that have been tried once and and won. But out of those that have been tried with some regularity, B4 seems to be the most successful. Although it's not even in in the uh, the engines, or at least Houdini 2's top five. But uh, that may be so much the worse for Houdini. Who knows? So this is an area to look at for either side. Um, bishop takes e5 is the main move, though, and that's what was chosen. Now, here, white played knight to e5, again, the main move, but bishop to d2, although less common, has its advocates. And the idea, obviously, is to castle as quickly as possible, and only then determine the disposition of the knights. Sometimes you might want to bring the knight to h3 in support of bishop to f4, if, for instance, black plays queen to c7. So there is something to be said for, for this move as well. And also, the bishop may, may swing to, to c3 in some cases, and then it might be convenient not to have the knight sitting on e5. So it's um, it's a it's a somewhat flexible move. All right, well, knight to e5 is flexible in another way, in that it leaves the, uh, the direction of the king still to be determined. Now, the main move here is knight b to d7, and it might just be the best move, too. It's certainly uh, been more successful. Now, there are possibilities to transpose back and forth between this and the move played in the game, which was castle and kingside. However, um, as we'll see, there is a difference. So, knight b to d7, knight g to f3, and now, of course, castle and kingside would transpose, or would transpose to what the game could have been, but um, there are also other options. Knight takes e5 is possible, but probably the best move, and definitely the most successful move, is queen to c7. Again, staying flexible, not determining just yet the position of the king, because once black castles kingside, that's going to sound the uh, the bells for white to, to throw the kitchen sink at the black king over there. So it's pretty smart for black to wait um, to see what white's king does. So if white castles kingside, then castling kingside is just fine. Then there's no, no worry here. The other move that's been played is bishop to f4. So this is, of course, um, waiting um, still to, to castle himself, seeing what black is going to do. But now black has this neat little bishop to b4 check idea when c3, bishop takes c3, b c3, queen c3 check, and lo and behold, the rook in the corner is hanging. So white could play king f1. He's done this on occasion. Um, but the main move and the more successful move has been knight to d2. But all the same, this is still a bit of a concession, I suppose. Uh, now black generally takes. And here, white is forced to take with the king because otherwise the knight on e5 is loose. So he's got to play king takes d2, and now black generally castles. 
All right, so both sides have gotten something out of this. Uh, White's grabbed the bishop pair. He still has a lead in development, a little more space. But um, the exchange is um, somewhat helpful for black, too, and it means that White's going to have to waste some time with his king. So this is um, just an interesting alternative to the, uh, to the text. Generally speaking, black has scored reasonably well with knight b to d7. But anyway, it's just a game. All right, after castling, knight g to f3, again, uh, knight b to d7 would transpose to what we, one of the lines we talked about and would keep us deeply buried in the bowels of theory or of, of book, if we want to keep the alliteration going there. Uh, but black played a6, which is a very strange move, at least it seems to me. Um, it's rare, strange, and unsuccessful. So it's only been tried three times. Black score out of the three games is castle and queenside, 0, 0, 0. And the reason why I say it's strange is that knight, or sorry, that um, black is not going to play b5 anytime soon, while on the other hand, white wasn't threatening to use the b5 square himself. So all in all, it seems rather peculiar. Anyway, um, white could castle here, and it's probably good enough for edge, but it's far less interesting. So Andraken chose to uh, just go for the throat straight away. No no uh, pacifistic impulses here. Uh, he's just going to take advantage of that pawn being on h6. He's going to use this guy here as a hook. So if the pawn were back on h7, black would really be a lot better off than he is here. So with the pawn on h6, g5 is coming. It's going to blast open some lines. It's going to give white's pieces the g5 square, which is a pretty nice square, as we will see in, uh, in a number of different ways, a number of different variations. And so black is already in, in some trouble here. All right. Um, only one of those three games saw g4. Uh, the other two saw white castle. As I said, white won all three. Now, in the earlier game, which was Melisitz and Mitic from um, some internet, some ICC event back in 2006, black played bishop to e7. So the game continued g5, takes, bishop takes, and now knight f to d7, which is probably also a mistake. Uh, black does want to exchange pieces in general. It's a good idea to swap off the attackers. But the thing you have to remember is you have to think not just in terms of the total quantity of pieces, but to think in terms of ratios. And um, the point is that white is essentially going to enjoy every single one of his pieces in the attack. Well, black has very few defenders over there. <clears throat> so a move like knight f to d7 is in fact helping white by eliminating one of black's few defenders. So um, I forget what white did. I think he played knight takes d7 here, but simply rook to g1 gives white a winning advantage, which uh, shouldn't be a huge surprise considering that white has six pieces in the attack. Both bishops, both knights, the queen and the rook, where the queen's about to be there. While black has what defending? I mean, he can swap off a pair of knights, can swap off the bishops, and then it'll just be four to nothing, not counting the pawns. So let's uh, let's have a look at some quick variations. So 95, 95. Now, if f5, white has lots of ways to win. The simplest is maybe even the best, but so simple anyway that um, we should just do this and leave this behind. So queen to b4 check is nothing on account of c3. And white doesn't, have, doesn't even have to take the rook. He can play queen h5 next. Um, and just keep the uh, keep the kingside play. So this is hopeless for black. Okay, bishop takes g5 instead. Queen h5, obviously. Now, uh, bishop h6 is, of course, completely idiotic due to queen h6. And if g6, then just rook takes g5, and some banal sacrifice is going to happen on g6 or maybe f7, but g6 is more more obvious and probably simpler and better. And black is dead lost here too. So finally that leaves f5. And now rook takes g5. And all right, the bishop on d3 is out of the attack, but the knight, the rook, the queen, and after white castles, the other rook too, are all going to uh, to join the feeding frenzy. So queen c7, all right, knight to g6, rook e8, and now castles, followed by any halfway sane plan for white, and um, black will be crushed like a bug. So rook, rook d to g1, f4 followed by knight to e5, you name it, it, it will just destroy black's position. So white is dead one here. All right, back to g4. 
Um, Sugarov played knight b to d5, which was a new move. Well, again, you know, it's only one predecessor, and that was an internet game. All right, uh, here, Andrekin played rook to g1, which certainly isn't bad, but there doesn't seem to be anything wrong with the obvious g5 either. So Andrekin decided to make one more preparatory move first. It's probably not bad, but um, let's look at g5 just to see how easy this uh, easy easily white's attack flows. So hg, bishop g5, queen a5 check, bishop to d2. And now let's take a look at a couple of ideas. Um, if queen to b6, then white can just castle. Now maybe Andre can saw bishop takes f2 and wasn't sure um, what was going on, because this covers the g-file, and black also has the idea of playing bishop to e3 to, uh, to, to keep the bishop from d2 out of the attack. But you know what? White's winning anyway. Rook d to f1, bishop b3, and now rook h to g1. All right, if bishop d2, then I think just queen takes d2 and queen h6, and that's going to be a, cat a catastrophe. So I don't see how black is going to defend against, well, any anything. Uh, rook takes g7, king g7, queen g5, king h8, queen h6, king g8, and then rook to g1 or knight to g5, whatever. I mean, it's all devastating. Not to mention, again, the immediate queen to h6. So this is just death for black. So, bishop takes g1. Well, rook takes g1, and again, white's attacking with six pieces, and black is defending with pretty close to zero pieces. Knight e8, I think, is close to forced, so we can play f5. So queen e4. Now, if knight d to f6, then queen h4, with, among other things, the idea of rook g3 to h3. And black is toast. All right, so let me get rid of that. Ah. Uh, let's see, where was I? I was here. Okay. So, f5, queen h4, and again, uh, the rook g3, h3 plan is one devastating idea. And um, if rook f6 with the idea of king f8, king e7, well now just bishop to g5. What is black to? If he goes to f8, back again, then just knight to g6 with the idea of queen h8 check, king f7, and then either knight to e5 is mate. Okay, let me get rid of this. And um, back here, if queen to b4, aiming to trade queens, then just takes. If queen takes h4, bishop h4, and white's a piece up. And if he takes, then c4. If the knight moves, then queen takes f6, wins a piece. If the knight doesn't move, c takes d5, wins a piece. So black is dead. Um, all right, back here. We just took the queen to b6. Knight to b4 is another option. It may be better, but the basic theme here, once again, is the white will attack with everything, while black's defensive resources are limited and indeed insufficient. So rook to g1, rook to e8, bishop c3, queen c7, and here uh, white's got lots of good moves. Queen to e 2 is very strong, with ideas like queen h6, queen g5, and even rook takes g7, followed by queen g5. There's perhaps the best move, which is knight to g5, threatening to just grab on f7 with one knight or another, and maybe with the second idea that we'll see later in the game. And then white can even play the cutesy knight to c6. But on this, maybe black can, can survive with this exchange set. Rook takes d3, cd3, bc6, bishop f6, bishop f8. White's still clearly better here after knight to e5, but the fact that white's king is... You know, not going to have the easiest time finding complete shelter. I mean, it's not really in danger, but if White wants to keep his pieces active, you know, he's got to try to do that while making sure there's no counterattack against his king. And it also doesn't really help White's cause that um, he's got a lot of weak pawns. So, you know, White is still much, much better, but Black at least has some slim hopes of survival. But I think, again, going back here, that if White plays something like knight to g5 instead of the uh, clever knight to c6, He's probably winning pretty quickly. Okay, so going back, I think g5 is winning or very, cl very close to winning at the very least. But rook to g1 is fine. And um, here, Sugarov makes a very bad, uh, comes up with a very bad idea. He plays bishop to b4 check, king f1, and then bishop back to e7. So he spent two moves to prevent white from castling, which doesn't so much endanger the king as it 
as it uh, keeps the rook from a1 out of the attack for a while. But still, um, given the perils of Black's kingside, it really wasn't uh, a good decision to sacrifice two tempi for this cause. Well, or a tempo and a half if you think the bishop is much better on e7 than on c5. Anyway, let's talk about two other ideas. If knight to b4, trying to get rid of this nice bishop, well, g5, of course, hg, rook g, or bishop g5, excuse me, knight d3, knight d3, bishop e 7 castles queenside, and again, white just builds, and black is going to be hopeless. You know, stumble on the, uh, the g file, put a knight on e5, and line up. And of course, even just direct moves like bishop to h6 are very strong here. So perhaps black's best move is queen to b6. And this has, uh, among other ideas, using the b4 square as a transit point. So there might be some lines where black can play queen to b4 and knight to f4. Um, some combination of that. Maybe swap off some pieces and try to block the lines of white's uh, pieces to, to get to the king side. So I think this is best met by, by a3. So this takes the b4 square under control. And uh, maybe White will follow up with g5. Well, that would be the obvious follow-up. But also c4 might be quite useful as well. Driving the knight back, maybe follow up with b4. In some cases, bishop b2. Lots of great options for, for White. Well, in the game, as I said, was bishop to b4 check. And here, White's position is so incredibly good that instead of king to f1, which is simplest and best, White could even consider c3, and he's even better here too. So takes, 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 king f1, bishop a1. So white's down the exchange in two pawns, but, again, all six of his pieces are in the attack. So g5, takes, takes. And white's uh, simplest idea here is to play queen e3, f4, h4, and uh, go, for the <coughs> excuse me, go for the kill there. Well, in fact, when the queen's on f4, the threats are already underway. So... Um, it's a very simple idea, but responding to it in a, in a satisfactory manner is uh, not at all simple. So there does seem to be one very, very complicated way featuring a whole slew of only moves that may allow Black to reach an inferior but drawn ending. That's how bad his position is. So just for fun, let's look at this. And where you might want to make it an exercise for yourself to see if you can calculate uh, anything that looks like a, a defensive approach. So again, White's idea is very simple. Queen e3, queen f4, and um, black is practically lost at that point. Okay, so here it is. b5, queen e3, bishop b7, queen f4, threatening to take on f6. So knight h5, queen h4, and now the big point, bishop takes f3. If knight f3, then queen d3 check and white's not going to be happy at all. So bishop takes queen, bishop takes e5, bishop g5. Materially speaking, black is doing really well, but his pieces are still kind of loose, and his kingside still got a little bit of trouble to, uh, to deal with. So it looks like the following is still kind of forced. f6, now f5, bishop to d1, Otherwise, he's losing more material. King e1, rook a to d8, so just in time. Bishop g5, hitting the rook, and the queen covers the bishop on d3. But now bishop takes h2, so still another not-so-easy-to-find move, especially 10 moves, 15 moves in advance. Bishop d8, rook d8, king d1, bishop g1, queen h5, rook d3, king e2. And here black's problem is the bishop on g1. White's going to play queen h1. So rook to d4 takes care of that. Now queen g6. And if rook to g4, then white just goes vacuuming up all the pawns, queen e6, queen f5, or queen a6, and so on. So black's best bet here is to just chuck the uh, the bishop for one of white's two remaining pawns. And I think this has to be a draw. I don't, I don't see uh, white's a pawn kind of uh, carrying the day here. So uh, if anyone has winning chances here, it's white, but... It's, uh, it's not very realistic. Still, getting here, you know, this, this is like a 20 move plus variation, and, uh, you know, black has to find a lot of very precise moves just to get there. But, because there is a there to get to, 
White was correct in not bothering him. He's playing king f1. So black played bishop to e7, and now it's just time for white to kill black, and he successfully did so. Um, Andrekin played g5, which is entirely natural and good, but it was also good to play h4. So it switches gears. White will take back on g5 with a pawn rather than a piece, but with ideas like um, g6 as a follow-up and maybe jumping on the, uh, the h file, black is dead lost there too. Or maybe uh, queen e4 after hg, hg, knight moves. Anyway, white played g5, and this was good enough. hg5, knight takes g5. And there's a sneaky idea here. And um, while it's sneaky, I'm not sure there's anything good that black can do about it. In the game, he played bishop to d6. And now see if you can figure out what white's move ought to do. It's quite nice. Well, the answer, knight h7. So that's a very easy move to miss. I mean, it might might not be so so difficult to find, or at least to consider, if there's a pawn there. But strangely, it's kind of an interesting psychological phenomenon that a move that you would consider if there was a pawn, even though it was a sacrifice, still a piece for a pawn, that you would consider that that kind of violent move when there's a pawn there. When the square is empty, often it's not just that one thinks about it and rejects it, but it just doesn't even get considered. Very, very curious. Anyway, knight h7 is, is just a, a crushingly strong move. Okay, so let's look at some variations. First of all, obviously, what happens if he takes? Well, if he does, it's kind of like a Lasker Bauer kind of situation, except instead of a two bishop sacrifice, it's a knight and a rook sacrifice, but with the same, the same general idea. So bishop takes, queen h5, rook g7, and now instead of the other rook coming over, bishop h6 check. All right, if the king goes back, obviously this is a quick mate, like so. Um, if the king goes to h8, then what do we do? Then, well, if nothing else, bishop to uh, g5, check, and we pick up the queen. Although I, I suspect there's got to be something even better, but that's certainly good enough. And then finally, if king f6, we play queen g5 mate. So knight takes h7 is no good. If king h8... Well, knight f6, knight f6, queen e3. Threatening queen h3, threatening, well, you'll see. So, what can black do? Let's say he plays b5. Well, check. Queen here, threatening mate on g7. And you can't move the knight because queen h7 is mate. Well, you can't move the knight to defend the g-pawn because queen h7 will be mate. And in case of g6, obviously, probably everything wins, but bishop takes g6 is the most simple move and there would be one very straightforward checkmating pattern. So back to knight h7. Um, in the game, Sugarov tried queen c7. And against this, bishop h6, so he just leaves the knight hanging. But, um, well, obviously it can't be captured here because rook g7, and then rook h7, and then queen g4 would be mate. Uh, well, that's if he's taking the knight on h7. Of course, there's also the knight on e5. But uh, but there too, bishop takes g7. Well, there too, you capture on g7, but this time it would be the bishop and not the rook doing the job. In the game, Sugarov tried knight to e8, hoping to uh, shore up the pawn on g7. Guess what? It didn't work. Bishop takes g7 anyway. Ha ha. Knight takes g7. Rook takes g7 check. King takes g7. Queen g4 check. Well... Black has uh, a very bad choice. If he goes to h6, it's mate 1. So he plays one more move, and now Andrejka makes the final nifty little blow after which the game is over. He plays knight f6. And black results. Uh, if bishop takes e5, then it looks like mate in, what is it, four moves? I think so. I don't see anything faster. So check, king here. Check, king back, queen h6 mate. Or mate, three more moves, sorry. And if he plays knight takes f6, then uh, a very standard, typical combination, but one that's worth worth seeing and knowing. Because we can do we can give the checkmate all with checks. Check, 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 and now we go back and then mate on h7. So really nice attack by by Andraken. 
to be fair, I mean, it kind of played itself, but with the one the one exception. So this this idea from here of putting the knight on h7 was really quite attractive. This was very, very strong. And that could have been missed by by most of us. But but certainly a lot of the moves were really very natural. And even this combination is not that tough. I mean, it's not that it's trivial, but, you know, uh, I think most of us, many of us certainly, would sense that there's something there. And then I think if we're patient, we'll find a move like knight to f6. And now that you've seen this pattern, too, with this mate, all with checks, I think that definitely improves your chances of finding that kind of a move. All right, so what's the moral of the story here? Well, certainly that this line with knight to d7, bishop c4, is uh, it's not completely domesticated. Black does have to be careful. So even though there have been thousands of games, literally thousands of games, in this variation, and the theory has worked out pretty deeply, it shows that even a very, very strong player like Sugarov um, can just fall apart in, in, a, in a hurry. I mean, okay, here we're still in theory. Knight b to d7 I think is best, but castling is okay. Uh, but within, I think, two moves... He's probably objectively lost. So I think already after rook to g1, definitely after bishop to b4 check, uh, I think he's he's lost. But he's already in pretty serious trouble here. Again, maybe queen b6. You know, maybe he has chances still, but I, I think it's already desperately worrisome. So if you play this line with black, I would really recommend knight b to d7 with the key point that you're not in a hurry to castle. So... Um, you know, that, that's the uh, the big idea. So knight g to f3, and now queen c7. Don't be in a rush to, to, to determine the position of your king. If white castles kingside, then you can castle kingside, and your life should be pretty okay. Um, and if white plays bishop to f4, you throw in this check, and again, this is going to prevent white from casting. Either he plays king f1 now, or plays knight to d2. And now maybe you can you can uh, do this. So this, this is, has at least been tested quite regularly, and, um, and black score is, is quite quite reasonable at this point. Okay, so that would be um, what I would have to say about the theory of this. It's a very pretty game, and, um, and probably the nicest game of that event. I mean, the other game that I think is really worth uh, examining, though it's Rui Lopez, uh, was the last round game between Grishuk and Svidler. So Grishuk at that point was tied for first. He was part of the six-way tie. The other five players involved in the tie drew in the last round. Um, and Grishuk, I guess, was pushing a bit against Fiddler with White and Rui, but um, in, a, in a very complicated game, Fiddler managed to outplay him. So I would suggest having a look at that game, too. And uh, but other than that, as I said, it was a pretty dry event. Not a lot of decisive games, and uh, a lot of the games really didn't have an awful lot of fight in them either. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this one, and um, I'll see you in a few days with my regular uh, quick Rui show. So take care. See you later. Bye-bye.